Hey now, it's time for another edition of Wrestling's Greatest Moments. Was Starcade really wrestling's real granddaddy of them all? That is, wrestling's first attempt at pay-per-view? How did Vince McMahon allegedly attempt to sabotage Starcade? And why was Starcade's success nearly ruined just a month after it occurred? Sit back as Wrestling's Greatest Moments looks at Starcade, the wrestling event that forever changed the grappling game. 1983 was the dynamic year for professional wrestling, the idea that wrestling promoters were entitled to run shows in a mutually agreed upon location was no longer written in stone. With promotions like Georgia Championship Wrestling and the World Wrestling Federation doing business in other promoters' territories, it was clear that nothing was sacred. 1983 was a robust year for several wrestling promotions, including Jim Crocker Promotions, popularly known as Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling. Territory featured many wrestling stars who had come into their own and were in the prime of their careers, including Nature Boy Ric Flair, Rowdy Roddy Piper, Ricky Steamboat, Cowboy Bob Orton Jr., The Great Kabuki, and Greg the Hammer Valentine, with veterans like Jack and Jerry Briscoe, Dory Funk Jr., Jimmy Valiant, and Dick Slater rounding things out, the promotion didn't lack stars. Jim Crocker Promotions also had compelling storylines driving the promotion, and a loyal fan base. With strong baby faces and heels, it was easy to draw fans from the local arenas. At the time, ticket sales were the lifeblood of every promotion. Promoters typically ran shows in arenas, which limited the number of seats. Some promoters held events in larger venues, such as football stadiums, but these were risky due to the added cost of holding these shows. Nonetheless, wrestling was enjoying a hot streak, and promoters were eager to capitalize on its popularity, especially as they faced competition from outsiders. Such was the case with Jim Crocker Promotions, as the WWF was beginning to run shows in their market. Earlier in 1983, Jim Crocker Promotions capitalized on the incredible popularity of a tag team feud involving heels Sergeant Slaughter and Don Kernoble against babyfaces Ricky Steamboat and Jay Youngblood, held at the Greensboro Coliseum. The match was the endgame of a feud that stretched for months and saw both teams beat each other senseless in a quest for the NWA World Tag Team Championship. The card was a legitimate sellout, with wrestling lore stating that thousands of fans were turned away at the door. Even the champions almost couldn't get into the show, with Slaughter and Kernodal reportedly stuck in traffic while they tried to get to the arena. Crockett knew he had a strong product, but how could he maximize profits and deal with competition from the WWF? It was time to think outside the box. The concept of pay-per-view in 1983 was much different than it is today. Once upon a time, promoters utilized closed-circuit television to expand the reach of popular events. For example, a boxing match held in Madison Square Garden could be expanded beyond the confines of the garden. Such was a case when Muhammad Ali battled Joe Frazier. The problem was that technology limited how many venues could broadcast on closed circuits. However, the ability to watch shows at home was extremely limited. While cable television stations had experimented with what we now consider pay-per-view to broadcast boxing matches, wrestling was unheard of. That would change within a few years, but in 1983, the idea behind Starcade was to offer the show to fans who couldn't get tickets to the live event. Starcade is sometimes described as the first wrestling pay-per-view, but that's inaccurate. In 1976, Vince McMahon Jr. aired the famous, or infamous, depending on your take on things, Muhammad Ali vs. Antonio Inoki boxer vs. wrestler match on closed circuit. McMahon had also experimented with closed circuit TV with Evil Knievel's Snake River Canyon Jump. In McMahon's case, his attempt at using closed circuit TV to expand the wrestling audience was a sound idea, where it failed was in its execution. Back when wrestling promotions relied strictly on ticket sales for revenue, it was customary to hold events on major holidays such as Thanksgiving and Christmas. Promoters had found that families liked to attend the events and that the tickets were often purchased as presents. This led to promoters often treating these holiday shows as major events where feuds were ended and fans got to see bouts or wrestlers they might not see during the rest of the year. For example, a promoter might book a steel cage match or book a battle royal with a fictitious prize of the winner driving off with a new Cadillac. Promoters might bring in a special attraction such as Andre the Giant or have a retired wrestler step back into the ring to dish out some punishment to some much hated heels. It was a winning formula that made holiday shows a must-see event 
and many times a lucrative one for promoters. Jim Crocker Promotions have been booking successful holiday shows for years and decided to go with a spectacular storyline involving popular babyface Nature Boy Ric Flair. Flair had skyrocketed to success after debuting in Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling in the mid-70s, eventually becoming NWA World Heavyweight Champion in 1981. Although Flair often worked as a heel outside the Mid-Atlantic area, and sometimes did there as well, he was working as a babyface in Jim Crockett Promotions when he dropped the NWA World Championship to veteran grappler Harley Race. Crockett crafted a story where Flair began chasing Race for the title, coming closer and closer to winning it. With Flair breathing down his neck, Race offered a hefty cash bounty to anyone who took Flair out of action. This led to a shocking heel turn during a match between Flair and Race. Wrestler Dick Slater showed up to attack Flair, but babyface comboid Bob Orton Jr. arrived to make the apparent save. Instead, Orton joined in, laying Flair out. Flair was beaten mercilessly and written out of TV with a career-ending neck injury. In true wrestling tradition, fans agonized. Flair announced he was retiring from wrestling. Race happily paid off his henchmen and was content with knowing he'd rid himself of his most determined opponent. Unfortunately, Slater and Orton found out that Flair was far from finished. He showed up on an episode of Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling, going after the two heels with a baseball bat. Flair was back, and he was looking for revenge. As wrestling fans know, revenge often involves taking a title away from your opponent, in this case, Harley Race's NWA World Championship. This led to NWA President Bob Geigel booking Flair and Race into a steel cage match, which at the time was the ultimate conclusion to any feud. Flair would finally have Race trapped in a cage with no outside help, but could he defeat the Wiley Champion? Jim Crockett hoped fans would want to see the final chapter in this long-running storyline. Flair's quest for the championship became known as a Flair for the Gold. Over time, it was announced that the match would take place at a special event known as Starcade. Starcade was about more than one match. As mentioned, holiday shows often featured the grand finales for feuds, and this show would be no exception. Starcade featured matches involving some of the most heated rivalries in the promotion at the time, including Rowdy Roddy Piper vs. Greg the Hammer Valentine, Charlie Brown vs. Greg Kabuki, and the team of Ricky Stimo and Jay Youngblood vs. Jack and Jerry Briscoe. The undercard featured a strong match with Mark Youngblood and Wahoo McDaniel looking to eliminate Dick Slater and Bob Orton Jr. from the title picture. Other matches included The Assassins vs. Bugsy McGraw and Rufus R. Jones, Abdullah the Butcher vs. Carlos Colon, and Johnny Weaver and Scott McGee vs. Kevin Sullivan and Mark Lewin. The card featured stars from Championship Wrestling from Florida as well as Puerto Rico's World Wrestling Council. Much has been written and said about Vince, Vince McMahon's ruthless aggression in trying to take out his competition. According to Harley Race, McMahon tried to buy him off just days before Starcade was scheduled to take place. In his book, King of the Ring, Race recalls McMahon inviting him to dinner in New York and offering $250,000 to no-show Starcade and come to work for the WWF. Over the years, there has also been speculation that Race would have brought the NWA World Championship to the WWF, dropping it to Hulk Hogan in a title unification match. Naturally, this would have made the NWA look terrible and could have devastated, if not destroyed, the Starcade event as fans were denied their main event. As Race tells it, he was in the bathroom with McMahon when he explained why he couldn't betray the NWA. Harley pointed to the mirror and said, I've got to look at that person when I wake up tomorrow. That wasn't the end of the meeting. Race explains in his book that Vince got upset and charged him, reportedly lunging at Harley's legs. Race says, I acted instinctively by cross-facing Vince with my left arm, getting his head in position where breaking his neck would be easy. Race's wife talked Harley out of doing anything rash. Although the meeting didn't go as Vince planned, Harley would eventually come to work for the WWF. However, that was still years away. Fans watching Starcade might be underwhelmed by the show's production values and its lack of the many things that fans take for granted, such as elaborate entrances, entrance themes, and lavish sets. As for the wrestling itself, Starcade featured a variety of styles and reflected the booking philosophy of the time, provide a variety of different types of matches, and build things up slowly from start to finish. That doesn't mean the opening bouts were snooze fest, 
but wrestlers tried not to upstage subsequent matches, especially the main event. It's always challenging for fans from one generation to watch wrestling from another generation. Nevertheless, Starcade has several matches that have become classics, both for their build-up and for the matches themselves. The Briscoes vs. Jay Youngblood and Ricky Stemo. This program went from a friendly rivalry to a bitter feud after real-life brothers Jack and Jerry Briscoe crossed the line between babyface and heel, working to injure Youngblood and Stemo. This rivalry continued for months until the NWA sanctioned a title match with special referee Angelo King Kong Mosca. The no-nonsense Mosca wasn't the only special referee on the card. Charlie Brown from Out of Town versus The Great Kabuki When Mid-Atlantic Championship hero Jimmy Valiant lost a Loser Leaves Town match, a mysterious masked man known as Charlie Brown from Out of Town showed up, picking up battles against Valiant's former foes. Determined to prove Valiant was hiding behind the mask, manager Gary Hart put up The Great Kabuki's TV title versus Charlie Brown's mask. The masked man won the match and the belt, with Jimmy Valiant mysteriously returning and Brown disappearing. And what of the main event? The steel cage match featured former NWA world champion Gene Kaniski officiating a brutal bout between race and flair. The champion was determined to end flair's challenge and his career, targeting flair's already injured neck. Despite race's best efforts, flair fought back hitting a high cross body block off the top rope for the pinfall. Perhaps the only time in recorded history the Nature Boy executed the move successfully from that day onward. Although Starcade proved to be a success, it became an annual tradition in Jim Crockett promotions and led to other supercards, it also marked a changing of the guard for the promotions. The WWF was still working hard to sign talent from other promotions, and it did so with Greg Valentine and Roddy Piper. In addition, Ricky Steamboat retired, depriving the promotion of one of its top babyfaces. While Steamboat returned from retirement, he too would leave for the WWF, jumping to the company in 1985. While Crockett underwent growing pains as a doubt with the loss of some of its top stars, a new influx of talent would take it to bigger heights. However, that's a story for another day. In the end, Starcade proved that closed circuit events could expand promoters' revenue, and before long, other promotions began exploring the idea. Crockett followed Starcade with Starcade 84. Over time, promoters were able to capitalize on changing technology and offer fans a chance to watch major shows in the comfort of their own home. Starcade was followed by pay-per-views such as The Great American Bash and The Bunkhouse Stampede. Starcade and The Great American Bash would continue when Ted Turner purchased Jim Crockett Promotions, transforming it into World Championship Wrestling. Vince McMahon had always known the possibilities of closed circuit events, and Starcade's success confirmed his beliefs. Unlike his previous events at promoting via closed circuit, McMahon had the right product in place to capitalize from. He took things even further when he created his WrestleMania event, broadcasting the show nationwide. It wasn't without risk, but the risk paid off and WrestleMania's success launched the WWF into a national promotion. While the WWE likes to refer to WrestleMania as the granddaddy of them all, savvy fans know that Starcade was the first successful wrestling show broadcast in what would later become known as pay-per-view. A left its mark in wrestling and pay-per-view continues to be a major component of professional wrestling. What do you think of Starcade's legacy? Did you ever watch any Starcade events or even attend them? If so, what did you think? Share your thoughts in the comment section and let us know if there's any videos you'd like wrestling's greatest moments to cover. In the meantime, subscribe to our channel, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and spread the good news about wrestling's greatest moments, the channel that celebrates the squared circle.